Hello and welcome to another Java tutorial. In this tutorial, I'm going to continue our discussion on solving systems of first order ordinary differential equations. And we said that the general format should be a vector that contains all the function, the ddx of a vector, y1, y2, ym, equals the uh, uh, m equations, all right, in x, y1, y2, and ym. And these equations, we don't have any condition on the equations. They could be linear, nonlinear in x, y1, y2, ym. These equations could be in general coupled to each other, which means y1 prime could depend on y2, y3, etc. Or they could be decoupled from each other, which means y1 prime doesn't depend on y2, y3, etc. Okay? But in general, we, are, we can uh, simultaneously solve for all the functions, all the m functions. And in order to do that, we need m initial conditions. And then we said that the idea is to do exactly what we did for uh, a scalar functions, a scalar problem, which only had one equation and uh, extend it to vectors. Okay, so because when we implemented Euler, Runge, Kutta, or midpoint method, we just had this iteration to generate a sequence that converges to the value of the function. And now we are extending this into a vector sequence, right, or array sequence, such that uh, the vector sequence or array sequence converges to a vector, that is this uh, vector of all the solutions, all the values of the functions at the particular point B or X1 here in this code, all right? And the beauty was that then uh, all the, we didn't really need to change that much into our code. We just replaced Y with arrays or ND array vector. And the reason we used ND array was because uh, this ND array is simply a wrapper for an is a wrapper for an array, but it also supports operator overloading. And using operator overloading allows us to write the equations in a very simple way. We don't need to write many for loops to just iterate over all the elements in the loop, okay, in the arrays. So it's just an elegant way of. Uh, removing all the unnecessary for loops that we have to deal with and they are all encapsulated in the ND array okay and we looked at some examples and one exam the first example was two equations that were actually decoupled from each other and uh, we said that uh, because the equations are decoupled we can solve them separately as uh, like simple ODEs or we can solve them together using a system of ODEs and then we looked at the gen more general case when we have coupled equations and we said that in physics and engineering typically we have this type of problems and as I mentioned all the, the right hand side of these uh, derivatives can in fact be nonlinear functions we don't care we can still solve it but we uh, we shouldn't have any singularities on x or y here right and now the very interesting consequence of uh, being able to solve uh, systems of ODs is being able to solve higher order linear ordinary differential equations. So far, we have only looked at the first order ODs. Y prime was uh, a function of uh, X and Y. But now we're going to look at, for example, second degree or second order or higher order ODs. And uh, we can uh, make, uh, use a very simple trick to, be, to solve these uh, higher order ODEs using the, the approach that we have for solving systems of ODE. And the trick is very interesting. So here is just an example, and it's very easy to generalize it. So let's say we want to solve a higher order linear ordinary differential equation using a system of ODEs. And again, when we say linear, it just applies uh, to the highest derivative that appears. So uh, basically, if I have an equation uh, that y is raised to some power, y prime is raised to some power, but y double prime has a power of one, I still consider it a linear and I still can solve it, okay, with the methods that I have seen so far. All right? So when I say linear here, I mean, in general, a linear ODE means uh, y double prime, y prime, y, they all have uh, a power of one, okay? But in general here, in I mean just y double prime has a power of one. So it could be in fact nonlinear in y and y prime, and I can still solve it, all right? So by linear here, I mean the highest order derivative 
should be linear the other derivatives and other terms in uh, that are that include y can in fact be nonlinear functions it doesn't matter that much now obviously the condition here is that uh, <coughs> a2 a1 and a0 a0 these coefficients which can be dependent on x they should not have any singularities in the region in the interval that we are solving for the function y all right but let's say everything is fine and uh, there is no singularity the the differential equation is linear let's see how we can solve this and uh, the way we're going to solve this is we're going to convert this second degree equation for example or second order equation into a system <clears throat> of a first order equations and in order to do that we introduce a change of variable or we introduce a new variable or if we have like why if uh, we have more than second derivative of the function we introduce more than one variable we introduce in general new a couple of new variables equal to the lower order derivatives so this is the keyword here for example in this equation y double prime y prime y we define a function z that is equal to y prime all right and then then this equation becomes a2 z prime plus a1 z plus a0 y equals f of x now this is uh, first order od in terms of the z function right because z prime and z appear but then the equation coupled to the y so one equation is just y prime equals z that's just the change of variable another equation is a2 z prime equals f of x minus a0 y minus a1 z and now we have a system of two first order ordinary differential equations all right y prime z prime equals f of x y z and uh, another function of x y z all right now we can solve this so now we have the standard form y prime equals f1 of x y z and the one is always just z because that's just the definition the change of variable and then z prime is f2 of x y z which is this right hand side here and now we can just easily solve it and we already know that in order to solve a second order differential equation we need to have two initial conditions one on y and one on y prime which translates into having uh, initial conditions for y and z here because z is y prime so we can uh, uniquely solve this second order differential equation by transforming it into a system of first order differential equations now if there was a y triple primes or the third derivative of y then we get three equations so z is y we define z as y prime we define another function let's say w as y double prime and then we get three equations all right so what's the benefits the benefit here is that we are simultaneously solving for y and y prime because we are solving for y and z and z is y prime so it simultaneously gives us y and y prime we don't need to calculate y first and somehow try to calculate y prime from y the information is already in the equation in this equation and when we solve it we extract that information not only the function but also the derivative y prime and once we have y and y, pri y prime calculating the y double prime is just an algebraic equation right because if i know y and y prime I put them in the equation and I calculate y double prime or z prime it's there is nothing to solve it's already solved right when I have y and z or y and y prime I can solve I can find y double prime all right so we can the way we solve this uh, transform this uh, differential equation into a system of first order ODs allows us to extract all the information of the solution not only the values of the solution but also the values of the first derivative second derivative etc and that's very powerful technique okay because in most cases not only we want to solve the differential equation and uh, find y but we want to also find the first derivative and second derivative now obviously transforming into a system and using vectors and arrays adds more computation right so it's a little bit costly if uh, we do this approach but it's a very straightforward and uh, uh, nice way of solving differential equation
and at the end we have y y prime and then uh, when we solve for y and y prime finding y double prime is just an algebraic equation so we can also have y double prime all right so again the equation only needs to be linear for the highest order derivative i.e y double prime because if y double prime here was to some power for example 2 and then we end up with z prime squared which we cannot solve using the previous techniques okay now let's see the power of this approach and the first one i'm just going to present some uh, some examples from physics and engineering which I, I think it's very interesting to look at them example one is the free falling ball so i have a ball i hold it at some position above the ground okay let's say at 200 meters above the ground at time t equals zero t is the variable of time and then because i'm holding that it doesn't have an initial velocity right because i'm I'm grabbing it, I'm holding it above the ground. So the initial velocity or y prime is zero. And then I let it go and I release the ball. So it starts to move towards the earth ground because of the gravitational force. So I know in general in Newtonian mechanics, the force is equal to mass times acceleration. The gravitational force is minus mg because the force is downward and I'm assuming the positive position, positive direction for y axis is upward. So then m cancels out, a is y double prime, acceleration, therefore the, the equation that I should solve is y double prime equals minus g or minus 10 meters per second squared. All right. I mean we already know that this uh, differential equation has a very simple closed form solution. But I'm going to use the method of systems of ODs because not only I get the position, I also get the velocity or the first derivative of position as well. So Z, I define a vector Z or array Z which contains Y of T and V of T. V is just Y prime, right? And uh, if you're familiar with the uh, Newtonian mechanics, typically the vector that contains uh, the position and velocity is called phase space vector. And uh, this is just a terminology and uh, it's good for you to know that. And uh, let's look at the code. And again, the structure of the code very similar to what we had so far for solving systems of ODE. So nothing is changed. I'm using Euler plus Richardson fourth order. Alternatively, I can use Rangakuta, which is recommended, but here I'm just using Euler plus Richardson fourth order. So we have the vector z that contains y and y prime. So z0 is y and z1 is y prime. Okay. So we have to define the derivative n function or z prime vector t and z. Uh, my independent variable is t time and z is an array or vector goes uh, to a to an array of two components, right? The first one is Z0 prime. Z0 prime is Y prime, which is Z1, okay? The second component is Z1 prime, which is uh, Y prime prime, Y double prime, which is minus 10 meters per second square, all right? What is T0? The initial time is zero. What is the y0? The initial position is 200. And what is the initial velocity? v0 or y0 prime is 0. All right. I have this. I have my equation. So I just create an ODE system solver, new ODE system solver, pass in the function, all the, all the equations, the time 0, and all the initial conditions for z0 and z1. So y0, v0 because z0 is position and z1 is velocity. And then I create the timestamps that uh, I, I want to find a solution at them. So from 0 to 6 seconds, 500 points. And then uh, 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 basically I uh, find a solution. So uh, z ode dot Euler, I call the Euler method, pass the array of timestamps, and then this the ode dot Euler for from the ode system solver returns a two-dimensional array, and each row, so I'm calling it z here, right? It's a two-dimensional array. Each each row gives me the solution of the function and all the t values for each component of the z vector. 
So the z0 is basically the values of the, all the values of the function z0, all right? So the values of the solution y are the first row, z0. The, for example, velocity is the z1, the second row of the z array. And then I want to also compare it with the exact result. So I use the function interface, function double double, func exact, t goes to minus 0.5 times g, which is 10 times t squared plus y0. And then I find the exact solution on all the t values. I call the array func class and uh, use the apply method, use the lambda expression, func exact apply, and apply to the t values array. And I, can, uh, I create the figure, I plot the ODE solution with blue, and I plot the uh, exact with red, okay? And then uh, uh, I just turn the markers on on the, on the solution. So this is how, and you see that we, not only I can get the position, but also can get the derivative of the y, which is the velocity. And uh, obviously velocity is a linear function, so its derivative, which is the acceleration, must be constant. That's what we started with, okay? So this is one example of the solving physics problem which physics problem and engineering problems are typically and we always end up almost always end up with a second degree linear second degree or second order differential equation so we can always use this uh, method of systems of ODEs to solve it and uh, as you can see here so the, the ball starts at y equals 200 meters and after about six seconds it almost reaches the ground, right? The position uh, becomes almost zero. All right, another, the other interesting example from physics is mass spring system. Now this is a, uh, basically a drawing of how it looks like the system. We have a string that are fixed at some point and then it's connected to a mass mass or an object, all right? Now the way the spring for, works, at least to the first order uh, approximation is that the spring has something called a restoring force, all right? And uh, the definition of the force comes from Hooke's law, which is an experimental law, all right? So the way it works is that uh, when we have a spring, it is at rest, right? So it has a length, so there is no compression or decompression on the string, right? So we call that initial length of the string or if one end is fixed, uh, the initial position of the other end as, as the rest position or X rest here. Now, if I compress or decompress the spring, then uh, the length of the spring or the position of its end point changes, right? and uh, the spring applies a restoring force on my hand because I'm compressing or decompressing it. And the direction of the force is always in the opposite direction of the, of the direction that I compressed or decompressed. And it's linearly proportional to the change in the length of the string. And the proportionality constant is called K or the spring constant. Sometimes it's also called the stiffness of the spring because the higher K means uh, it's harder to basically compress or decompress it. So if I change the length of the spring from its initial length or the rest position, then I get a, I, there's a restoring force on me, all right? And uh, so let's now assume that we have an object connected to the spring and the system is at the rest position. So originally there is no compression or decompression on the, on the spring, okay? Now I move the, uh, move the object this way in the positive direction of the x-axis by two, let's say two centimeters, all right? And let's assume that the rest position is 50 centimeters. So this was originally 50 centimeters. And now I decompress the spring by dragging the object two centimeters in this way, right? In the positive direction. Note that I'm still holding the object, okay? 
So at uh, the, so the initial position of the object is x rest plus two centimeters, which is fifty-two centimeters. All right, x rest is fifty. I drag it this way by two centimeters. So initial position of the object is fifty-two centimeters. But because I'm not letting go, the initial velocity of the object is zero because it's not moving. I'm holding on to it. All right, and then. Uh, at this position, two centimeters away from the rest position, I let go of the object, all right? Because at the initial position here, uh, this, the spring has been decompressed, so it applies a force in the negative direction, right? So it moves the object back, and at the, uh, when object reaches the rest position, it's still moving because it's still accelerating. So it goes back and compresses the spring. And as it compresses, the force in the opposite direction, the positive direction, it starts to increase. And eventually, it can completely cancel out the acceleration. So it stops the object and pushes it, pushes it back. So we can see that if we, if we ignore the friction, there is a damping effect. The mass, the object should oscillate indefinitely around the, about the rest position. And that's exactly what we see in the solution. So we already understand the force that is applied on the object, the initial conditions. So the initial position of the object is x rest plus 2 and the initial velocity is 0. Okay, And we want to find the position and velocity of the object as a function of time. So what is the differential equation that we need to solve? The differential equation is force equals mass times acceleration. And the force is minus k x, which is the position of the object at each time at each point in time, minus x rest, which is the original length or in original uh, length of the spring. Note that what I want to what I want you to really understand is that the x rest or the rest position of the spring is not the initial position of the object. The initial position object is some uh, some distance away from the rest because we need to compress we need to initially compress or decompress the the spring so that it can apply a force on the object and be able to move it around okay if the initial position is x rest the solution is that the object cannot move because initially there is no force on the object so that's uh, that's very important to understand so the force is minus k times x minus x rest equals mass times acceleration, mass times x double prime. So x double prime plus k over m, x minus x rest equals zero. And again, x rest is not the initial position of the object. x rest is the initial length or the initial position of the, uh, the, the other end of the spring that is not fixed. So the spring has one end that is fixed and we call it x equals zero. And then the spring has another end, which is not fixed and cannot can move and compress and decompress the, the spring, okay? So x minus x rest. So x zero, or the initial condition, initial position is x rest plus two centimeters, and the initial velocity is zero. And again, the Java code is exactly the same. We define a vector z that uh, has two components, x and x prime. And typically, uh, uh, this k over m, we already know that the object must start to oscillate. So k over m is the frequency of oscillation squared. That's uh, usually in the physics textbook, they define omega 0 squared. So here I'm defining omega 0, 2 times pi. So the frequency of oscillation is omega 0 over 2 pi, which is 1 hertz. That means that the periods of oscillation should be 1 second. Every 1 second, the object from here goes here and comes back, all right? And we will see that in the solution. So omega zero is two pi, t zero is zero, x rest is 50 centimeter, x zero is x rest plus two centimeter. The initial velocity is zero. I define the derive n function, t and z goes to a two component array. The first one is z zero prime, which is x prime, which is equal to z one. And the second one is z1 prime or x prime prime x double prime which is minus k over m minus omega 0 squared the minus sign is here minus omega 0 squared times x which is z0 minus uh, x rest okay
remember to, we have to include x rest here because the force for a spring the force always defined as the compression and decompression from its rest position or its uh, rest state now that we have the drift function or all the two equations we define our ODE system solver passing the function, the initial time, the initial position and initial velocity these are the initial conditions and then the t-valves I want to solve from t0 to 10 seconds after that t0 plus 10 seconds 1000 points and OD solver I'm solving using the Runge Kuta method at 1000 points returns a 2D array the first row of this 2D array Z is the all the values of X function at all the time steps and the second row Z1 here is all the values of the velocity at all these time steps all right and then I plot the X so T values X with blue with uh, blue color time and xt and similarly I can plot vt so I automatically solve for x and x prime or x and v and then obviously x double prime is just minus uh, omega 0 squared x minus x rest alright uh, so yeah so uh, let's look at the solution so we said that we expect because of the restoring force and the fact that the force changes direction when the spring is compressed or decompressed the object should start to oscillate about this rest position and the amplitude of the oscillation should be two centimeters and that's what we see so 50 centimeters is the rest position and we drag the object two centimeters away so the origin the x0 or initial position is plus 52 centimeters and then the object uh, <coughs> starts to oscillate so the solution is sinusoidal it goes down to 48 centimeters so it comes to 50 centimeters but it doesn't stop it goes to 48 centimeters come back up to 52 48 52 etc and as we expect the period of oscillation is one second so the period is one second as we expect because I said omega 0 to 2 pi so f0 or the frequency is omega 0 over 2 pi which is 1 hertz that means uh, the t t0 or the natural oscillation period is 1 over f0 which is 1 second and if you look at the velocity the sign of the velocity can actually tell us which direction the object is moving so originally when the object is here and we let go the, or initially it's the speed is zero but then it becomes negative negative means the object is moving in the negative x direction so it's moving this way and it comes to the rest position here the velocity is maximum when it comes back to its original rest position but then it's the velocity it's not zero it's actually maximum so the object has a lot of velocity when it reaches here so it continues moving and now it's compressing the spring and then the force changes direction and it tries to stop the object that's why the velocity is negative so the object is still moving in this direction but because it's compressing the spring the its velocity starts to de uh, go back to zero and when it's to zero the spring has been compressed a lot and then it forces the object to move back now the velocity becomes positive so the object reaches here and then it moves back so again a very classic physics problem and you can uh, make this more difficult by hooking up another spring and another mass to the original mass so we have two springs and two masses maybe at some point in the future I'll look at this problem too but again as long as we can write down a differential equation we should be able to easily solve no matter how many objects we have how many springs we have okay now the last uh, example is from electrical engineering and our LC circuits, resistors, a resistor, an inductor and a capacitor. And again, this is also similar to mass spring. And uh, this is more similar to the mass spring by including the friction. In other words, LC systems, inductor and capacitance, they always oscillate. 
but then if we have a resistor it's a damped oscillation so eventually the oscillation dies after a long time and we will see that now uh, let's say we want to find the solution for this uh, system so if I apply a force if I know RLC values if I apply a force I want to know the current that is flowing in the circuit as a function of time I can also find uh, basically the current is shared between all these uh, components because they are all in series so the KCL rule tells me that the current that goes into the R also goes into the L and goes into the C all right so I'm going to define I as IL the uh, current of the, in the inductor as the current of the circuit and there is another component which is the voltage across the capacitor all right so what is the solution if I apply a voltage as the source here V of T it's equal KVL rule of a, a circuit tells me that the total uh, the sum or algebraic sum sum of all the potentials across all components in a loop must be zero in other words the voltage that I drop here should be equal to the sum of the voltages across all these components and the voltage of a resistor is R times the current so R times I L uh, the, uh, the voltage of an inductor is L times D I D T so the derivative of the current through an inductor gives me the voltage of the inductor but then for the capacitor is the other way the the derivative of the voltage of the inductor uh, of the capacitor the derivative of the voltage dvc dt gives me the current of the capacitor which is the equal to the current of the inductor or the current of the circuit so if i want to write kvl or this equation purely in terms of the il or the current of the circuit I have to replace VC here with the integral of IL then I don't have a differential equation I have a differential integral equation and typically what we do is we take one derivative from the whole equation then we I have dv dt r d i dt l d squared i dt squared plus uh, basically here dv cd dv t dt which gives me i so I end up with a second order derivative, second order differential equation. But then the problem here is that we have VT, basically dV dt, the derivative of the voltage. And in general, this voltage could be a discontinuous voltage, could be just a step from zero. It suddenly we turn, we have a switch, for example, in the circuit, and then we close it. So it's a step, and its derivative becomes uh, something undefined. At exactly we. Uh, close the switch for example so in order to avoid that what I'm going to do instead of uh, turning this uh, circuit into a second order differential equation in terms of the current and uh, with the dv dt the derivative of the voltage source I'm going to turn it into a, a system of two first order differential equations basically a system of ODEs and the state variables in uh, circuit terminology we always talk about the state variables of the circuit they're always the current of the inductors and the voltage of capacitors that's because uh, the voltage of the inductor is the derivative of the uh, of the current and the current and basically the current of the capacitor is the derivative of its voltage so voltage of the capacitor and the current of the inductor are always the state variables in a circuit all right so in a, i'm going to convert this problem into a system of odes two i have two variables or two functions the current of the inductor which is also the current of the circuit and the voltage of the capacitor and i can find them simultaneously which is very good and uh, uh, when I find this, I can immediately find the di dt because I know vc, I know i, and I know v. And also, when I find uh, uh, basically, uh, yes, I can also find uh, uh, this equation. I already know i and v, so the only thing I can find next is uh, the voltage of the inductor and voltage of the resistor as well. So let's see how we can solve this circuit and I'm going to look at two cases. 
The first one is undamped oscillation, which means the resistor is zero. There is no resistor here, L and C. And I just apply a voltage, turn it on, a step voltage. So the voltage is zero, and then I turn it on at T equals one second. All right, let's see. So let's say the resistance is 0.2. Let's not worry about the units at the moment. The capacitance is one and the inductor is one. So if you're familiar with the circuit theory, we know that uh, omega zero, the natural frequency is one over the square root of LC, which is one over one, which is one radians per second. So F zero is omega zero or two over two pi. So F zero one over two pi and T zero or the period of oscillations for L and C is 2 pi or 6.3 seconds. So every six and a half seconds roughly, we should see an oscillation. And now I'm defining the source voltage, this VT here. And the way I define it, I use the functional interface and use a ternary operator because I want to apply a step. So I said that if T is less than one, my voltage is zero, the source function uh, returns a zero as a function of time. If T is greater than one or equal to one, I return one. So I'm applying a step voltage from zero volts to one volts exactly at T equals one. So obviously before T equals one, before applying the voltage, the, the system or the circuit is at, as, is at rest. And the way I enforce that by setting all the initial conditions for IL and VC to zero. Okay, so T is zero is zero, that's initial time. IL zero, the initial current for the IL is zero, and the initial voltage of the capacitor is also zero. This means the circuit is initially at rest, and when I apply a voltage at one second, before that, the I should be zero. There, there should be no current flowing in the circuit. And we will see that in the solution too. So initial conditions, the values of the parameters and the source function, and then we need to define our derived N function, which is a T and Z. Z is a vector, our state vector, which is IL, the current of inductor and the voltage of capacitor. And uh, this must return uh, an array of two components. I call them equation one and equation two. Now equation one is this one. And I should write it in terms of the state variables. So equation one should be Z zero prime equals equation one, right? What is Z zero prime? Z zero prime is D I L D T. So I have to reorganize this equation. So it's a source voltage minus uh, uh, which I'm going to apply T because it's a function. I have calculated the value of the source voltage at time T minus R I L R times I I L is uh, the zeroth component of the Z vector minus V C V C is uh, the second state variable. So it's Z one divided by L. All right. Inductance. So this is how reor I reorganize this equation. So the second equation should be Z1 prime equals the function or the equation. Z1 prime is VC prime or DVC DT. So I have to reorganize this by moving the C on the other side. So Z1 prime equa equals equation two, which is one over C times IL. And IL is Z0. So Z0 divided by capacitance. These are my two state equations, all right? And the rest is very simple an array of two components that I call them initial conditions, IL0, which is zero, and VC0, which is zero. So the circuit is originally at rest. And then I create my ODE system solver, passing the function, passing the initial time, which is zero, and passing the array of initial conditions. And then T valves, I'm going to calculate from T0 to T0 plus 50 seconds later, 1000 points. Obviously, I'm using Rangakuta fourth order, and then uh, it returns an array of uh, a two dimensional array of values. I call this Z again. And then the first row of Z vector of this two dimensional vector is the values of the first state variable. So IL, the values of IL or the solutions are Z0, the first row. And the second row is the values of the second uh, state variable, which is VC.
So I simultaneously calculate for ZL, IL, the current of the inductor and the voltage of capacitor. And then I'm plotting uh, T valves and IL, the current of the inductor. As I mentioned, so this is the, let's look at the first case when we don't have any uh, damping or resistance. In this case, uh, we see that before applying the voltage at T equals one second, the current is zero. That's what we expect because there is no initial condition for current is zero. So the circuit is at rest and there is no current flowing. As soon as I apply a step function, so the voltage, the applied voltage goes to the one volts, okay? The current starts to oscillate with a period of two pi. That's because we don't have any resistance. So L and C, the, it's a perfectly periodic uh, oscillation. Okay. Now, if I change the resistance to 0.2, so we have some damping. So the resistor burns some of the current. And basically, it uh, doesn't allow the current to freely flow in one direction or the other. Because the current is originally positive, which means it runs in this direction and then it becomes negative so it changes direction and the reason is how the magnetic induction works in the in the uh, in the inductor you can look it up in the physics books if i have resistance we see that uh, the current starts to go up to one but then as it comes back and it continues over time we see that it dies away the current dies off and that's because of the fact that the resistor is basically killing the um, it's killing the uh, it's killing the uh, the current the flow of current right and uh, another way of looking at it is that when the current becomes zero there is no voltage across the resistor and then uh, there is also no voltage across the inductor, right? Because di dl is also zero after a long time. So all the source voltage must drop across the capacitor. So if I look at, in this case, if I actually look at the solution for VC, we see that it actually oscillates around one volt and eventually settles on the exact voltage of the source, one volt. And that's very interesting because uh, in many physical cases, we always have an RLC and we try to look at the voltage of the capacitor and it gives us an overshoot which after a while it dies away and becomes the voltage of the source and we call this the settling time. So I'm just going to show you that when this case happens and there is some resistance or damping, when the current goes to zero, the voltage of the capacitor eventually settles exactly at the voltage of the source, which here is one volt. So let's head to Eclipse and try to quickly look at this. So in my example packages, I have this RLC circuit, all right? And uh, here I'm going to plot the VC. VC as a function of time and the resistance 0.2 capacitance and the voltage is one volt right so at before t one second the voltage is zero the source voltage after t equals one second the voltage becomes one so let's look at the voltage of the capacitor now here yeah. so as you can see uh it's zero before one second and then uh, <clears throat> we know that let's also plot the source voltage that would be very interesting uh, Pick that plot, T valves, and then I'm going to uh, do the array funk apply source voltage. T goes to uh, basically source voltage. Source voltage. Yeah, my eclipse is lagging a bit dot apply t and then apply this to basically all the t valves and i'm going to plot this with color red all right so Okay, why is this complaining? Okay, this should be T-Val with a small V. Okay, 
So we're plotting the voltage of the capacitor and what I mentioned is that if there is da some damping, if there is some resistance and the current dies away, af dies off after some time, then the voltage of the capacitor should eventually become the voltage of the source. So let's see. So the red curve here is the voltage of the source and the blue curve is the voltage of the capacitor and there are two things here so uh, one is this oscillation and we call this uh, settling point or the settling voltage of the capacitor it's the final voltage or the settling voltage and the time that it takes for these oscillations to effectively die it's called the settling time which in this case is very long you see if you, after 50 seconds there is a, still some oscillation and the peak the maximum peak that always happens in the beginning is called the overshoot and overshoot is typically a problem when we are dealing with the uh, control circuits for I mean most of the times in the control theory we have let's say a sensor that controls the temperature of an object and we want to lock the temperature at some value there and we always design a circuit that tries to do a feedback loop and it eventually it ends up being equivalent to an rlc circuit and this overshoot problem and the settling time problem is always a problem now the response of the circuit is fast so it can quickly rise up and but because of the fact that uh, it's a second order equation it oscillates so a first order system basically what happens it doesn't uh, do any overshoot but it has a rise time exponentially rise time and it's a pretty slow one okay so a second order system or an all lc system can in fact have a faster response but it runs into the problem of overshoot and settling time so this is one interesting thing that uh, uh, I wanted you to see. We can also look at the longer time, let's say 100 seconds instead of uh, 50 seconds. Okay, so now you can see that the voltage of the capacitor has basically effectively become the voltage of the source. If I apply one volt, the voltage of the capacitor as a function of time eventually becomes that because the current dies off. But then we have all these oscillations and a very long, very large overshoot here. And this period from one second that we apply the voltage to let's say 60 seconds that the oscillations die is called the settling time. And obviously in this circuit it's very long, okay? So I hope you enjoyed this uh, <coughs> lecture. Uh, please stay tuned. I have more lectures to come and I'll see you in the next one.